my channel, this is Tita Lavinia of Tita's of Pageantry and for this episode, I'm going to be giving you a full review of the Miss Universe Philippines 2021 National Costume Presentation. So please make sure you stick around, please subscribe to the channel as well as hit that bell notification button for your weekly pageant fix. Hey guys, how are you? I hope you enjoyed the music video launch. Chaz, that will get me into trouble, but I think it's pretty safe to say that you and I, we had the same thinking. I mean, I was there with you. I did a live session, and I think a lot of us were really confused why the national costume presentation was the way it is. This is a segment in the competition that I'm really invested and interested in. So when I watched the... um presentation earlier, I was as confused as you were. I also waited for more video footages to come right after the credits because I just couldn't get my head wrapped around the fact that it was only for six minutes. Now, if you remove the introduction, if you remove the credits, we were only left with a little over four minutes of footage for each of the ladies. Now, according to the statement that was released by um, Walter Tayag, the um, Director of Communications of Miss Universe Philippines, it was um, something new that they wanted to tap. Um, they wanted something that you could watch over and over again. That's why it was cut short. That's why the format was very music video-like. Now, I don't know if you're going to buy this because I have read a number of comments saying that it's not really supposed to be that way because in my personal take is that if you're going to be staging a national costume competition in the middle of the pandemic, after all of the delays, after all the moves from one province to another, after all of the difficulties in sourcing materials, then you know now would be a nice time to give back to the creatives who actually made the garments, who actually conceptualized the idea. So for the exposure to be reduced to a mere maybe four to eight seconds yeah it, it's it's a little sad um especially because this is the first time they tried a different concept in the past um for the national costume it's free for all you could be theatrical you could be avant-garde you could be traditional you could go for i don't know food maybe but this time around they had a specific theme now for me this was really very promising at first because it felt like you know, like a challenge for the creatives and the girls to come up with a costume um, within the limits of the theme. And I like that they were able to do this just a few days after the Met Gala. So this had a very Met Gala feel. So when they announced that it was going to be a theme that focused on the Manila Carnival Queens, of course, I got even more pumped. Because if you are Longtime followers of Tita's of Pageantry, or if you have been a subscriber at the Tita Lavinia channel, then you would know that this is right up my alley. This is something that I've talked about extensively. I even did um, a YouTube video very early on in this um, channel's lifespan about the Manila Carnival Queens from the 1908 to 1939. So yeah, I was a little disappointed that the efforts of the creatives were not highlighted and that they went through all that trouble anyway of securing a venue of you know putting up a production and then they couldn't spare more airtime for the ladies that it ended up as if the ladies were accessories to the boys who were singing so yeah i wished it was the other way around so for this national costume presentation, the organization decided to group the ladies per region. So for Luzon, the show was opened by the beautiful Janela Kuwaton. And I thought that it was a great move to have Janela open the show because she was absolutely stunning. Her hair and makeup was on point. Now, Janela, of course, is representing Albay, but... Her national costume was a Tiboli-inspired, reimagined costume for the Manila Carnival, which was made by Gerson Dima Vivas, who we all know was also the same costume maker for Catriona Gray at Miss Universe 2018. Now Number two is one of my favorites from Luzon. In fact, one of my favorites in the whole competition in terms of costume. I'm talking about Mirhian Hippolyta of Angeles. Now, for me, she was one of the ladies who nailed the brief. Um, the, one of the ladies who really got the assignment. And I think this has something to do with the people behind her national costume. Um, her national costume was made by Friedrich Policarpio with a collaboration of one of our favorites in the doll um uh, doll fashion industry. I'm talking about doll couturier Cholo Ayuyao. And 
I also like the inspiration or the thought process for um, Mira John's costume because it talks about the Queen of Tarlac and it also pays homage to her grandmother. And I thought that was really sweet. Number three from Luzon is also one of my favorites. Um, her name, of course, is Victoria Velasquez Vincent of Cavite. Now, her gown was made by Nat Manilag, and then her beautiful headdress um, with pearl accents was made by Christopher Munar. Now, I really love this presentation because she looked ethereal. She looked like she could be on the pages of a Victorian magazine as well. I felt that you know, it was on point, on trend, and, you know, we always tell Victoria she looks like Mama Mary, and with everything put together, she looks like Mama Mary. So, yeah, good job. Next, number four is um, fast becoming one of my favorites in the competition in terms of personal style. I'm talking about Jan Luis Abejero from Reina Mercedes Isabella. Now, the statuesque beauty paid homage to the crops of um, Isabella, particularly that of the golden yellow corn um, by Roel Rosal. And I also also like that you know it, it just didn't bank on the punchy color of the terno with the corn kernel um accents she had the ostrich fan she had the headdress so yeah that could pretty much pass as a, a carnival queen look number five is someone so extra only because she understands the brief and she has the manpower to have it executed and i'm talking about laguna's laren may bautista now hers was a joint collaboration um, that was made by chico estiva and renee salud so she went more on the traditional side in terms of presenting her national costume. I remember posting um, her photos on the Titas of Pageantry page and saying, this reminds me of fireworks because it was gold. It had lots of sparkly accents and even the sparkly accents looked like fireworks, if that made sense. And if you look at um, Larry's journey in pageantry, the whole ensemble could be like, the love child of her other national costumes. So yeah, I'm going to flash a photo so that you would understand that all three um, national costumes are actually somewhat related to each other. So I really like the nod. Number six is one of the freshest faces here in the competition. She is also, if I'm not mistaken, the youngest. I have Simone Nadine Bornilla of Marinduque. Now, Simone's look was really fresh. I thought that it really um, fit her age. And, you know, she had... Um, a hard-hitting fashion designer make the dress for her and I'm talking about the designer based in LA Oliver Talentino um, of course you know Oliver Talentino now what she wore was a dusty rose terno ensemble but this time it's a little more baguette um, it wasn't terno terno so yeah um, this one had pink paillettes and tassels and apparently the major inspo for the whole look was um, a nod to Miss Rosario Cayetano who also happens to be the first Miss Marinduque Number seven for Luzon is Kisses de la Vine of Masbate. Now, for me, I was really pleasantly surprised with what Kisses brought to the table. I mean, if you look at the look, this is something that we've seen before in a lot of the Carrie Santiago um, uh, creations. But this time around, um, of course, we have to give credit to the designer. Um, the name is Pauli Lagyap, and there's definitely hugot in um, Kisses de la Vine's costume because it's not just a bird bird. Apparently, it is uh, a bird that's really recognizable and famous in Maspate. And this is called Delapay. Now, Delapay, um, according to the, the description, is like a cross between a heron and a seagull. And, you know, this totally makes sense for Masbate with their rolling hills facing the sea. So, yeah, it would really make sense to design festivals around that bird. So, I guess it's really popular because the bird motif was not just on her headdress, it was on other parts of the actual terno. And I really love the hair and makeup people um, who made it possible for Kisses to look like that. I thought that they got the makeup saturation just right. So yeah, go ahead and go for this look. Next, um, another um, revelation in this competition is, of course... Maureen Robowitz, who is definitely displaying the same um, attack she did at um, Asia's Next Top Model. You know, she is a bit more on the timid side, but, you know, towards the end of the competition, she would, you know, charge at the competition and gain momentum. And this is exactly what she's doing right now. Maureen was our fashion bangus this time around. She was in a creation made by Louis Pangilinan. It was silver. It had scales. It had all of the trappings of the sea, it made sense that, you know, she was depicting bangus from Pangasinan and what Pangasinan is also famous
famous for rock salt. So yeah, you could see um, the inspiration from the beadwork, from the crystal work. So it all came together. And what I really loved about Maureen's presentation was just the vibe that she exuded. At least for the first couple of seconds, you could see her smile. You could see her expressions. She's very expressive. She's playful. So yeah, more of that. And um, I thought that was a really successful look for Maureen. Another successful look was um, is from someone you probably um, wouldn't think of uh, advancing in the competition this way. I'm talking about Jane Nicole Miniano and um, she's from Romblon. We've been talking about her extensively for the you know past few days and hers was um, an intricate on. This is of course a traje de mestiza. She went more for a traditional look and hers is an intricate mix of pearls and beads and because she's from Romblon, they also took inspiration from Romblon's finest marble. And then we move to the ladies of NCR. So we have a number of ladies um, comprising this group. Number 10 is Isabel de los Santos of Makati. Now hers was a pink creation by Osgo. And this was um, a modern barong with a Sampaguita mashup. So yeah, um, I think that the color really suited um, Isabel. I just felt that maybe the details were a little too loud, maybe a little too big, that it drowned Isabel a little bit. So maybe if they could just, you know, edit some of the elements, it would have worked perfectly for her. Next, I have Maria Corazon Abalos, of course, Corinne Abalos of Mandaluyo. Hers is a creation made by Joji Aguilar. Now, if you look at her national costume, it's a terno. It has all of the headdress and all of the trappings of the Manila Carnival Queens. But um, the overall look also has um, a pre-colonial vibe to it. And I guess it's because they took inspiration from the love story of Manda and Luyong. Um, apparently, this was a love story between a daughter of a chieftain and um, just like a warrior, someone, someone. So I understood the romance factor of the actual costume. So yeah, um, good job for Corinne as well. Jasmine Umali of Manila, one of the most talked about ladies in the competition of recent times um, because, yeah, I'm not going to even go into details what happened there. But a lot of people are, of course, rooting for Jasmine to do well after the ordeal that she suffered from some folks. We're not going to name them. But yeah, um, I'm really happy that she did well for this competition. And I'm also liking the fact that as an artist, I feel like she has a stamp in what she presented. So what she presented was a creation by June Samson Pugat. Um, and it was a nod to Carmen Papa in 1925. I don't Number 13 for NCR is also something very simple, elegant, yet impactful. Did I just say impactful? Word of the day. I'm talking about Ingrid Santa Maria of Paranaque. Now, hers was um, a creation made, of course, by the amazing Rajo Laurel. And I love the connection um, that, you know, is pretty common with these ladies. They seem to have connections with their grandmothers because according to... Um, the post of Sam Santa Maria. This was actually a nod to her gra uh, great grandmother, Carmen Arnaiz um, Zaldariaga, who was Carnival Queen in 1937. And she wore a silver fringe um, dress with an exaggerated color. This was um, inspired by the same gown that her great grandmother won the title in. Number 14, also from NCR, we have Princess Krista Singh of Pasig. Her ensemble was made by Armand Marco, but if I understand correctly, the um, accessories and I think some of the elements of the costume was also provided by one of our good friends, Gang Alonto. Now, the inspiration for um, Krista's uh, costume is the Pasig City slogan of flowing with hope. So if you look at her costume, you may think that it's just, you know, you know, your typical terno, but towards the hem of the um, skirt, you'll see um, the graduation of color. So this represents water because as we all know, Pasig is also well known for Pasig River. So um, they also took inspiration from Nicanor Abelardo's Mutya ng Pasig, which was, you know, which had a very 1920s feel to it. 
Number 15 from NCR as well, we have Rosane Marie Bernos or Ayin Bernos of San Juan. And she wore a distinctly Edwin Uy creation. And if you look at it, it doesn't seem to point at a specific time period or a specific um, like tribal inspiration or ethnic group because the inspiration apparently has something to do with diversity so if you look at the costume it's vibrant it has all of um, Edwin Uy's signature beadwork um, as well as um, play of mixing together fabrics so if you look at it it's distinctly Edwin Uy um, but it also seems like a mashup of all of the other works that he has done before so Wrapping up the ladies from NCR, we have, of course, Katrina Dimaranan of Tagig. Now, hers was just a beautiful purple creation by Valtaguba. Now, if you look at it, it does look more of a successful evening gown. I wish she would reconsider and use something very similar as an evening gown. But they also had um, modernized some... Um, elements from the Manila Carnivals, just like the beadwork. Um, according to the description, it was uh, a nod to art deco motifs. And then instead of uh, wearing the poofy butterfly sleeves, um, you know, just added like a fringe, uh, no, not fringe, like a festoon detail um, for like the shoulder part or the arm part. So I also like that she picked this color. I thought that the color looked really nice on her. And apparently this was um, mixing something old with something new. They took older elements and then reinterpreted this in a modern silhouette. And um, that this was actually um, Katrina's mom as well as her grandmother's favorite color. So I thought it worked well. I just felt it was a little too modern for me. So I don't know. Um, it's still free for all anyway. Now we move to the ladies of Visayas. It's really very exciting this time because some of my most favorite costumes are actually in this group. Um, number 17 from Visayas, the first lady who you know presented herself is Cristel Abelio of Aklan. Now I love, 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 love this costume. And I feel that I love this costume because I'm so sorry. I initially thought that this was done by Leslie Mobo, another designer um, from Aklan, but I am so sorry. Um, this was not a creation by Leslie. This is actually a creation from Ryan Salazar Lopez. And um, this was apparently made with piña fabric. Um, it goes really well with BGYO song kulay because you know it's very colorful and if you look at it it's very intricate I love the colorful um, appliques and beadwork because usually you would do you know like monochrome stuff but yeah they went a little crazy with the colors and I just love it because it's costumey it's theatrical and um the shape is also right. Um, like I said, there were only a few ladies who got the shape and the silhouette right. So if you photograph um, Christelle with even her her hair in finger waves and all of her accessories and um, the religious relics that she was wearing, I thought that was really, really nice. Number 18 from Visayas as well, we have Noelin Campos of Antique. Now, I have very little to say about this national costume, not because I didn't like it. I actually like the top part of it. It's just that I have very little information on what the make was as well as uh, who the designer was because I feel like it was just so unfortunate. Some of the ladies had an exposure of at least eight seconds with Noelin. They couldn't even complete the name because it was already cut and then another girl came in to follow her. So yeah, I think she had about four to six seconds of... Um, exposure so i thought that they were doing some of the ladies a disservice because i felt that the editing was moving towards the advantage of the song instead of you know focusing on the ladies because they were cutting segments for some of the ladies and unfortunately i noticed that for noelin very little can be said about her because yeah she didn't have a lot of exposure and that has nothing to do with noelin or her creative team that had something to do with the people deciding on the editing so 19 now i guess 
this one is just so out of the box. Um, this ticks all of my um, fantasies and I really love that they went for this concept and that they went big on this concept. I'm talking about Beatrice Luigi Gomez of Cebu City's Bakunawa. Now, if you're not familiar with your Filipino mythology, Bakunawa is, of course, our depiction of the serpent eating the moon. So um, this pretty much explains the you know eclipse. So, but... Yeah, they went really crazy beautiful with this costume and even the um, the photos and the videos that came with it, it was, everything was just so beautifully done. First of all, um, the costume itself, I felt it was really intricate. It had iridescence. It had a lot of references to um, sea creatures, marine life. It was luminous. It had lots of um, embellishments and, you know, a play of fabrics. I love Beatrice styling. Um, I loved her styling from the show. I also love the styling that they did for her for her editorial photos. I love the headdress. It reminded me of Nicole Kidman um, as Satine in Moulin Rouge. But, you know, there really is thought process in this um, costume because if you flip um, the photo, you would actually see serpent-like images really swallowing the moon. Um, and then becoming like more of a crescent moon. I love the play in shape. Um, she wasn't in a dress actually. She was in a pants suit. Um, the pants part was really funky. It had lots of wave patterns. And it really reminded me of the creations of Paul Poiré. Um, he was known as the king of fashion. He was really um, innovative in presenting fashion, especially at around the time that everyone was just so restricted by the corset. And he took a lot of inspiration from the exotic East. And I, I see a little bit of um, that in Bea's um, national costume. And I feel like it has some, a connection to the same uh, period. 20, also from Visayas, is another heavy favorite who was, um, yeah, talked about these past few days. I'm talking about Cebu Province's Steffi Rose Aberasturi, who featured a golden terno, but this time around, it was made by Malaika Yamas. It's a nod to the rattan or the weaving culture that they have in Cebu. As we all know, Cebu is also quite famous for their furniture and, you know, the treatment of weaving. In fact, we have seen this... Um, technique before. This was done by Carrie Santiago in also one of the dresses that Gazzini wore at Miss Universe. And then um, if you remember also Mariam Habach of Venezuela in one of the um, Terno shows here in the Philippines during the pre-pageant activities. I love that Steffi is true to her core, true to who she is, true to being Cebuana because she chose the colors that are um, associated with Santo Nino. So she has a lot of these um, gold and crimson things going on. My only um, disappointment was that because the segments were cut extremely short, we weren't really able to appreciate the reveal. We weren't able to really appreciate the little details of this actual dress. Number 21, I felt had one of the most interesting um, national costumes. I'm talking about Kesha Ramachandran of Iloilo City. Now, Iloilo is home to some of the best statesmen or women in the area. You have Pura Villanueva Calao, who was the very first carnival queen, who was brilliant herself as a writer and an intellectual. Um, you also have uh, Graciano Lopez Jaina, someone that we studied in school. You have Miriam Defensor um, Santiago, and some of the embellishments were taken from um, the motifs that are on the Molo church, like the pillars and, you know, just how pretty everything is. And I like how striking this costume was. Unfortunately, we weren't able to really appreciate the rest of the costume. The top part, yes, we were able to appreciate the beaded part. But if you are able to really see the full costume, it's like a printed newspaper with all of these luminaries printed at the back. So I thought it was a really good nod to um, those who made, you know, Iloilo proud. Number 22, I have Grace Vendiola of Negros Occidental. Now, she went on a more traditional route. Um, hers was made by Jerry Fernandez, and it was a traditional traje de mestiza, maybe a little exaggerated, but it definitely had a lot of pearls. And during the Manila Carnival, pearls, crystals, and even diamonds were, like, huge. In fact, there was one story on um, Maria Calao, um, the daughter of Pura Villanueva, who also eventually became... Um, 
a revered center of the country that during her reign as Manila Carnival, she had to have so many security details surrounding her because she was dipped in so much jewelry that she needed security. So there. Okay, so now let's move to the ladies of Mindanao. Um, opening this one up, number 23 is Megan Roa Digal from Bukidnon. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of information on what she wore, um, only that it was made by Boogie Rivera. And this was because uh, at around the time I was doing my research, and even now that I'm checking this, um, she hasn't really posted anything and she hasn't really tagged people for me to check what the actual inspiration was for. Number 24, um, she looked really good at this uh, presentation. I'm talking about Tagayan de Oro's Vinci Bacalares. Now, Vinci had a very colorful costume thing going on. It was graphic. The lines um, were really evident. And I loved her hair and makeup in this presentation. This is called Paksoy Hu Higuanon, which means that this is a dress, the Paksoy, that is worn by the people um, in CDO that's called Higuanon. So this definitely is a mashup of Roman Catholic faith as well as Islamic motifs. So if you Number 25 from Mindanao, I have Jedaida Corinihona of Davao del Sur. She was in a Tinalak um, ensemble that was handwoven by the members of the Balaan tribe. And this was made by Nina Richie Geffi or Jeff. I don't know. I'm sorry. Number 26 from Mindanao as well, we have Chela Falconer of Misamis Oriental. Um, Chela shares the same designer as Vinci, Gigi Aisa. Again, I'm so sorry if I'm butchering your name. And this time around, her brown ensemble was um, inspired by the Kuyamis or the Coconut Festival in Misamis Oriental. And if you look closely at the details, it's made with fishnet fabric, coconut shells, and this pretty much... Um, shows the sustainable living that um, people from Misamis practice. So it was a really nice way to um, offer something, you know, more environmentally friendly. And, you know, we're always telling Chella nowadays, if this doesn't work for you, go check out Miss Earth. But yeah, it was a really Miss Earth move. Number 27, we have Michelle Angela Ocol. Um, she is, of course, representing Shargao. And her ensemble is um, derived from Aman Sinaya. If you're not familiar, she is the goddess of the ocean. So you have a lot of really marine um, motifs going on from the color to the embellishments and the pearls on her costume. Now, unfortunately, this costume was made by the late Eva Martinez Havel. So I thought that... Um, Angela or yeah, yeah, Angela did a really good job in showcasing um, Eva's uh, creation. And then wrapping up the ladies for Mindanao and you know the ladies for this batch, we finally have some movement. We finally got to see her and we're so happy that she was able to make it this time. I'm talking about Chrysalin Valencia of um, Davao and she is wearing a Silverio Couture design and the inspiration is very easy to decipher. She says that it represents the colors of the Carnival Queen. And if you look at her, being from Davao, you have, you know, the Islamic um, motif of the actual dress. But the colors are amazing. Um, it doesn't really need an elaborate explanation. If they tell you it's the colors of the Manila Carnival Queen and you see all of these colors, then yeah, they definitely nailed that one as well. So there you go, guys. I know that this review is a little longer, but I hope I gave justice to the creatives who did um, these wonderful creations for the ladies because I feel like, yeah, they need a spotlight. They work for this in the middle of the pandemic. Um, acquiring materials and securing manpower to do everything and then you know move these costumes around um, requires a lot of effort so i will see you again very soon